Welcome. Today we are talking about the Strix, or the Strix Witch. It's a long forgotten myth of yore, the concept of which evolved over time to be the vampire myth that we know today. The monster likely began in the Greek world and flourished throughout the Roman and medieval periods. The Strix is a, in its monstrous form, is an evolution of the Greek harpy. The Strix is a terrifying witch that possesses the ability to turn itself into a were-bird-like creature with the intent of snatching and killing children as they sleep. As we discussed on our presentation on Greek witchcraft, ne many necromantic spells called for the use of children, sometimes alive, sometimes dead. Furthermore, many necromantic rituals called for the use of body parts of a deceased individual. Right? This body snatching proved to be such a large concern that many would hire a guard to watch over the corpse of their loved one to keep them from being desecrated by necromancers who would be looking to steal pieces right, of the corpse for magical purposes. We'll look at a story here. One must focus one's eyes continuously on the corpse, straining them and not allowing them to blink. One must never divert one's gaze or even glance to the side, because those hateful women can skin shift into any animal and sneak in secretly in new guise. They could easily get the better, even if of the eyes of the sun or of justice, for they take on the forms of birds, or again of dogs and mice and even flies. Then with their awful spells, they bury the watchers in sleep, so it's going to put the guard to sleep so it can get to the corpse. No one could begin to estimate the number of ruses these evil women devise to service their lust, but no more than four or perhaps six gold pieces are offered in reward for the job, as deathly as it is. Right, so they're not going to pay a lot of money to these guards to stay up all night and watch over a corpse, but it goes to show you just how fearful people are of these necromancers who, who are plundering corpses for, for magical purposes. And so the fear has run wild amongst the general public regarding the, the necromancer. But because of the necromantic practice of, of using children in rituals, um, either abducting them to use as a medium or for use most horribly as an ingredient in a ritual, right? The public's fear is going to birth from that the idea of the child-stealing witch as an archetype that could also shape shift. Now, the practice of necromancy originated in Mesopotamia, in the Middle East, and even before we get to Greece, ancient Greece, we can see the legends of the child-stealing witch present in Mesopotamia. This is from a, a 12th century BC text um, from Babylon. Her hands are little, her fingers are very long, her elbows are dirty, she enters through the door of the house. She slips in past the door pivot. She kills the little ones. She has given it, the child, a seizure in its abdomen seven times. This is from 1200 BC from Ugarit, Ugarat. Excuse me. Daily she counts the days of pregnant females. She pursues those giving birth. Bring me your sons that I may suckle them and your daughters that I may raise them. She enters the open house. She sneaks in by the door of the closed house. You have never ceased absorbing the blood of humans, the flesh that one must not eat, the bone that one must not crush. So you get the idea early on, as far back as 1200 BC, the idea of a witch coming and drinking blood of, of a person, in this, in this case a child, is already present. Right before we even get to European history, it's present in, in 1200 BC in Mesopotamia. All right, so these myths are coming over. This is uh, from a 1000 BC uh, text from Nineveh. Goddess whose face is fearful, by the name of the great gods enchanted, with the birds of the sky fly away, 
Go away, remove yourself, and fly away from the body of this child. You drink the blood of men that is not for eating, their bones that are not for nibbling. She sweeps, swept innards of pregnant women. So she's, she's eating the innards of the pregnant women. Violently, she tears, tears the child out of the pregnant woman. Serpents in the hands. Okay, so here we're already looking at the child snatching, the idea of a witch going in and bringing out the child of, of a live woman. Um, we know this was a thing to do to women who were already deceased, right? Um, in, in grave robbing, it was to extract a fetus. Um, but here the fear is that they're going to do it to someone who's still living, who, al who is alive. Um, which is actually very similar to the Greek gelo, right? Um, we'll, we may talk about that in, in another um, episode. But when we get to the idea of the monster itself, right? The bird, right? The were bird. Um, as seen in the Odyssey, right, the harpy can and does grab people and fly away with them, right? Um, and we'll, we'll look what, we'll look at what, um, Ovid has to say about this. There are some rapacious birds. These are not the ones that chinted Phineas's mouth of his table, the harpies, but they derive their descent from them. They have a large head, their eyes stand proud, their beaks are suited to snatching, they fly by night and seek out children without a nurse, right? They, they snatch their bodies from their cradles and mar them. They are said to tear apart the innards of suckling babies with their beaks, and their throats are engorged with the blood they have drunk. They are called strigus, right? Um, the reason for the name is that they are accustomed to screech in dreadful fashion during the night. Whether then these creatures are born in avian form or they are created by means of a spell, and a Marcian dirge transmutes old women into birds. They came into Procus' chamber. The boy had been born just five days before, and now he was fresh prey for them. They sucked out, they sucked out his infant breast with eager tongues. The unfortunate child wailed and called for help. Alarmed at the cry of her charge, his nurse ran to find him. She found that his cheeks had been gored by hard talons. Okay, so... You get the idea here that of an attack described in Ovid by Ovid in the Fausti. I will tell you a tale to make you shudder, or an ass upon roof tiles. When I still had my hair long from being a boy, um, she, our master's favorite boy died. So this is a slave describing the encounter. He was a pearl and delightful in every respect, while his pitiful mo mother was mourning over him. And many us were, of us were feeling miserable about it. The strigae suddenly started to screech. You would have thought it was a dog chasing a hare. We had at the time a slave, tall, quiet, daring, and strong. He boldly drew his sword and ran out the door, carefully binding up his left hand to use as a shield. He ran one of the women through in the middle, round about here. We heard a groan, but honestly, I won't lie. We did not actually see them. Our great hulk of a man returned within and threw himself down on the bed. His whole body was black and blue, as if he had been beaten with whips. We shut the door and returned to what we were doing. But when the mother embraced the body of her son, she, she, as she touched it, she soon realized that it was just a tiny thing of straw. Right? So, the here, the witch created a distraction, came in, and swapped out the baby for a doll of straw. We look at what Varius is going to say about this. The Greeks call a strix. The name is applied to evil doing women who they also call flying women, volatical, right? And so the Greeks have a custom of it were, right? Send away the strix, the long eared owl strix from people, the bird that should not be named. Now, besides blood drinking, right, uh, there's another method the Strix would use. And we could look at it from a Roman source here. If ever a black Strix attacks boys, milking her fetid dugs into their lips as they push them forth to suck. So what, what they're saying, fetid meaning terrible smelling, dugs meaning nipples, right? If you ever meet anybody named 
Doug, I guess, you can let him know that his name means udders or nipples. Uh, the point here being is that she is poisoning the boy and killing them with, um, with poison from her breast, right? So she's breastfeeding the child to death with the poison. So that is another method. And here, this is probably the first source we get of a way to ward off this type of creature. Um, he notes that they should have garlic tied around the child at night to prevent the creature, the Strix and Striga, from coming to uh, to take him, right? So the garlic here is probably the first instance of garlic being used against this, this vampire-like creature. Ovid describes this. There is... There is the old woman called Dipsis. I suspect that she shapeshifts and flits about among the shades of the night, and that her old woman's body is covered with feathers. This is what I suspect, and this is what they say. Also, double pupils flash from her eyes, and the beams shine from twin circles. This woman set herself the task of violating the chastity of my girl's bedroom. Okay, so what he's describing here that her his daughter was attacked by the creature. This is from Metamorphosis. One day Photis ran up to me quivering with excitement. She told me that her mistress said she was having no success in consummating her love with other techniques, was growing to grow feathers and become a bird during the following night and fly down to the man she desired. Accordingly, she bade me prepare myself carefully to watch this great spectacle. Then around the first watch of the night, she led me herself to that upper room. We tiptoed quietly. She told me to watch what went on through some crack in the door. This is what I saw. First, Panfile, which is a, a, a name for a witch, um, divested herself of all her clothes. She opened a casket and took out a few little boxes from it. She took off the top of one of these and scooped some lotion out. For a while she worked it between her palms, and then she smeared herself all over with it. From the ends of her toenails to the hairs on top of her head, she had mysterious conversation with her lamp, so she's talking to her lamp, and her limbs began fluttering as they gently flowed, soft down sprung from them and strong feathers grew her nose grew hard and became hooked and her toenails cured round into talons an eagle owl or booba was made of pamphile with this she issued a mournful screech and then testing herself jumped up from the ground a little higher each time then, then she pulled herself aloft and flew out of the house using the power of her wings so she turned herself into a, uh, a bird or owl-like uh, creature. Now people, unfortunately, right, were, were indeed suspected of being a Strix or later a Striga. Typically, the, the necromancer or the witch was the prime suspect during the Greek and Roman period, right? Because there is these things actually happening, right? The, the, um, the act that has inspired the myth is still occurring. But as the practice of necromancy died out in the Middle Ages, the myth of the Strix and the Striga and the fear of it remained. Now during a time of plague, right, there's mass burials. The very sick at times are mistakenly buried, right, amongst the dead and then if you will, will resurrect upon awakening, you know. So they, they come out of their grave because they're still alive and they, they were buried alive, more or less. Now, those people were often accused of being Strix or a Striga or some type of, like, creature and were either killed or banished. So, so real people are being punished or being accused of being these creatures or, and are being killed for it or at the very least um, banished. There are other ways, though, that they that they decided that that um, that someone was a a striga, right? And uh, various different things, oddities, right? A unibrow, um, more or less ridiculous things. 
But the interesting thing is how they maimed the corpse, right, um, when a person believed to be this creature had died. The corpse would be decapitated. Um, and the, the bearing, the head would be buried separate from the rest of the body, right? And this was believed to prevent the creature from rising from the dead. They would also a lot of times bury the face, head, the body face down with a sickle around its head so that if it tried to rise up, bloop, the head would be gone, right? Other methods would include burning the body, hammering nails into various parts of the creature's body or the person's body, um, putting something like flint into the mouth, right? Putting a brick into the mouth. We see this here, a case of someone in Venice in the 16th century having this happen to them. Um, another one is, is exhuming a body in the presence of a priest, getting it blessed, and then having them reburied again, right? Um, so all of this is happening. People are dying. People are being accused of being this type of creature, uh, and people are being dying because of it. So much so that government action is going to be taken. And you know it's bad when the government gets involved, right? No one should take it upon himself to kill another person, serving woman, or maid on the basis that she is a striga. Because such a thing in no way we believed is, is in no way to be believed by Christian minds. Nor does a woman have the ability to devour a person alive from the inside, right? So... This is the church clamping down on some of these superstitions out here. This is the the Edict of Rothery, right? So they're clamping down on a lot of these wild, fantastical, folkloric ideas that don't match, mesh well with, with Christianity. We talked about in previous episodes, before we get to the witch hunts in the Renaissance, right? And, and, and in the early medieval period, the church has this, this concept of... of well, the witch isn't real, right? Because because that's not a Christian thing, right? They don't have those powers. Um, and, and so persecution is a rare thing of those types of individuals. Um, and so this is the church combating such hysteria and trying to combat belief in magic and of witchcraft in general. This is another one. If a woman has, has called another a striga or a herbal witch, she is said to pot, pay a fine of 12 solidi, Right? So in this one is just a fine. If a person has called another a Heraburgius, which is said to be a Striaportius, right? Or a, a porter or a, an assistant of a Striga. Or one who is said to carry a cauldron to where the Striga make their meal and has not been able to substantiate the allegation, he is to be liable to pay a fine of 2,500 denarii. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> If a person has called a freeborn woman a striga or a prostitute and has not been able to substantiate the allegation, he is to be liable to pay a fine of 7,500 denarii, which is massive. If a striga has eaten a person and has been convicted of it, she is to be liable to pay a fine of, of 8,000 denarii. So that, that's interesting. There's, there's not a death penalty here if a striga has eaten a person and been convicted of it. They have to pay a fine. So there's no mention of death there, but I'm, I'm pretty sure the capital punishment, um, it goes without saying, is involved. And that's from 507 AD. Um, this one, if anyone is deceived by the devil and comes to imagine in the fashion of the pagans that a man or a woman is a striga and is eating people, and for that reason burns the woman herself or gives someone else her flesh to eat or eats her himself, he is subject to capital punishment, right? which makes sense. Um, but you, you see the idea of the church here. If anyone is deceived by the devil and comes to imagine in the fashion of pagans that a man or a woman is a striga, right? So a Christian shouldn't be having thoughts of the idea of a striga existing, right, in the first place. It's probably going to be why... Um, the myth really begins to die down and become isolated in in pockets of, of Eastern Europe <clears throat> over a long period of time. So like places like Romania, Poland, um, Bulgaria, those myths are going to hold on, but most of Europe 
that myth, this myth begins to die out, and it's partly because of the church clamping down on it. Uh, and, and rightfully so, because people are, you know, dying. Similar creatures we, we've, we've spoken about to some degree in, in the demons of the ancient Greek world would be the Lamia and the Gelo and the Mormo. Right, we'll, we'll mention the Gelo and, and the Mormo now. At any rate, the author of the secret book of Solomon says that Gelo kills embryotic babies, all the ones that slip from the womb. Right, so what they're talking about here is, is a stillborn child. The Gelo has done that. But the prevailing opinion these days ascribes the ability to old hags, right? So again, the witch is shape-shifting into something. It provides them with wings and sends them unseen into children's homes. Then it has these women suckle the children and themselves suck all the, as it were, moisture out of them. At any rate, the women that attended childbirth called the newborns that waste away gelo devoured, right? So we're talking about stillborn, um, most unfortunately, stillborn children. The things that terrify children when they hear them refers to Mormo and Lamia. Mormo was a Corinthian woman. She devoured her children and then in the evening flew up into the sky for some reason. Right? So um, this is a story that's going to be told to children to scare them about, about the Mormo, right? Uh, misbehaving children. But we can see here that these people have a very deep-seated fear for their children. Right, um, it's it's a ancient boogeyman, if you will, inspired by um, necro possibly and probably necromantic practices, because there is a strong correlation there. Right, um, but people are always and all, always been right fearful of um, harm done to their child. They're certainly certainly with good reason. Right, um, and so we see various manifestations of that. Right, so. Throughout all these videos we talked about, I hope the one thing you've really noticed is that imagination is king in the mind of the ancient person, right? Um, the logical answer is often dismissed in favor of the fantastical one, all right? That, that is the common theme throughout the vast majority of the videos we've made, right? Which is why things enter into the realm of mythology. Right? Why did this happen? What is that a tornado? No, that is Typhon, the god of all monsters. Right? Um, you know, so certain things that science could not explain, or that perhaps science could explain, um, the fantastical was often preferred. Right? There were people who believed that there was no such way um, uh, the Strix existed or had doubts about it. Right? But the the fantastical would rather be believed than than the logical. Saw what the church had to say about it, right? That, that that's an imagination of the pagan mind, right? These monsters are. No good Christian would believe in such a thing. What we see earlier on that there's doubt, right? E placed even earlier with, with what we're about to read from Pliny. Pliny has the following words here. The only female creatures to have nipples on their breast are those that are able to nurse their offspring. None of the creatures that lay eggs has nipples, and only those that give birth to live young have milk. The bat is the only bird that has the milk, for I consider the claim made of strigas that, they're, that they milk their dugs into the lips of babies to belong to the realm of stories, right? So that, that's earlier on, much earlier on, right, the, the, the early Roman period, right, the Roman period, um, there's doubt, right? This is a fantasy, this is a story, but people believed in it regardless of what uh, maybe more educated minds believed. And the power of folklore, of imagination, proved far more powerful than, than the world of logic and, and reasoning in ancient times. And so we see interesting things like this evolve, right? The Strix becomes the Striga. The Striga um, becomes the Strigoi. The Strigoi becomes the vampire, right? And, and so the legend evolves and remains among us to this day. The Lamia bears also uh, some resemblances to the uh, fantastical creature of the Strix, 
right? So we'll, we'll take a look at this, at this primary source here by Gervis of Tilbury. On the subject of the amazing things in this world, there is the question of the Lamia and the Draki. Of these two classes, Lamia are said to be women who penetrate houses by night to disport themselves in them briefly. They open storage jars, go through baskets, drag children from their cradles. Medical specialists affirm that the Lamia, which are commonly termed masque or in French, stria or striga, right? are the nighttime fantasies, right? These result from the thickening of the humors, which has an effect upon the soul of people as they sleep. <clears throat> and now, so here they're offering, as early as here in the Middle Ages, right? They're offering a medical explanation for what's happening here. They derive their name, Lamia, um, because they lacerate babies. Larvae, by contrast, as it were, the fantastical visions of Lares, which take on the forms uh, and appearances of people. They are not people, but illusions taking on the shape of people by some secret divine leave. For demons can do nothing without divine leave, whether it pertains to the human body or the human mind or the soul. So this is what they're saying here is in this Christian world, they can only be demons because we don't believe in any of this other stuff, right? <clears throat> They enter houses, attack people in their sleep, and inflict tangible dreams upon them. By this means, they make them cry out. But they also, as it would appear, kindle lamp, pull people's bones apart, sometimes also fixing them back together again in chaotic arrangement, drink human blood, and transfer little children from one place to another. All right? So, the Lamia certainly bears resemblance to the Strix, uh, the Striga. And we have one last description of them from Greece, which is one of the most interesting things, I think, in the Thebian. Lamia is a monster conceived in the deepest parts of a Charon, in the Fury's unspeakable holes. The monster had the face and breast of a girl, but from her head there rose a snake, hissing continuously, parting her ruddy forehead. Then this dread blight slid into rooms by night with the scaly gate. Her bottom half also consisted of a snake. She snatched newborn souls from the bosoms of their nurses, devoured them with bloody bite, and grew fat on the grief of the land. When the uh, monstrous killer, Corebus, the Greek hero, encounters her, the Lamia was holding the bodies of two uh, small children and had already hooked her hand into their guts, right? Um, so you get the idea here. This is a child, another child-snatching creature which is similar to the Strix, right? Which is drinks blood, preys on children, grabs them, takes them away, and, and devours them. But people are very afraid of their children, and for their children, and, and for good reason, right? People have always been fearful of their children, and these boogeymen, right? Uh, imagine a time when it's not just the children that believe in the boogeyman, it's the parents, too. And how that shapes your world, right? Um, when when folklore and fantasy um, are the paramount way of thinking, right? Uh, what wondrous and horrifying reality we can create for ourselves, right? When we ignore logic and reasoning and, 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 and other things. So um, it was a very fascinating world these folks lived in. I hope you enjoyed watching um, this video. Um, you all have a great rest of your day. If you have questions, comments, feel free to ask. I'm, I'm happy to answer.